With the new influx of CPUs from both AMD and Intel, we wanted to round up all of the most recent launches from both companies in one piece for a firm recommendation on the best CPUs for different use cases. Those use cases include best gaming overall, best budget gaming, best overall or all around CPU, best small business or hobbyist production CPU, best workstation CPU for someone who's really using it to make money with their computer, and then we'll be looking at most fun to overclock and of course, most disappointing. So all of this is meant to help people who are just in the market to buy something and maybe don't want to consume the literal hours of content we've released in the past few days on CPU reviews. If you want in-depth, really detailed information on each CPU individually, check out the review for the CPUs as mentioned. Otherwise, this will help you get a baseline for what's going on in the market if you're out of the loop. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and our brand new Gamers Nexus wireframe mouse mat. Aside from being the best way to directly support our long form investigative reporting, you can also get a custom made high quality mouse mat made with a high detail 3D design that we created to show off heat sinks, coolers, video cards, and more. The mouse mat uses a stitched blue border for added longevity, a blue rubber underside for unique flair, and a microfiber cloth for smooth tracking. The mat is 36 inches by 12 inches and fits a keyboard and mouse easily. We sold out of the first run in 48 hours, but have more getting made right now. To backorder your mouse mat and ensure you get one in the next run, go to store.gamersnexus.net and backorder yours while reducing our reliance on advertisers, or click the link in the description below. The format here is going to be similar to our end of year roundup, so the real goal is to just give a direct recommendation on the different types of workloads for each CPU. That means we're going to be leaving out a lot of the more technical, really deeper information that we've had in our reviews. So again, check the reviews for that information if any of these CPUs interest you on an individual level. We'll link the recent reviews below for the most relevant recent ones. And then in the article provided alongside this video, we'll also have links to each of the reviews uh, from when they were published. So this won't be as focused on numbers, but we'll still include some charts for you for the most pertinent information. And uh, we'll instead be focusing on presenting the data rapidly and for someone who's interested in a roundup of just trying to pick something. We're going to start out with some of the newer stuff from Intel and AMD alike. And then we'll work through a couple of the other recommendations where it's remained CPUs from end of year last year because not that much has changed. Now, of course, there are new CPUs immediately on the horizon. There always are, and we won't be able to include those. But at least for now, for a little while, this content will remain uh, a useful starting point for figuring out what CPU to buy. And then you'll have to check back once more stuff comes out later. One final note before we get started with our choices for the best of each category. Some of the data in here might be from older reviews, like some of the Threadripper stuff. That's because we're just trying to pull a bunch of different sources from different points in time, from our testing, from our reviews. And so you might not be able to compare all the charts in this content to the other charts in this content. But within a given chart, you'll be able to make direct comparisons. And then obviously, again, the original review would be the source for the cross comparisons within a methodology. Intel's new Core i5-10600K is the one that we're giving best gaming, despite the 10900K running technically higher performance stock for gaming. We have good reasons, though. The first of which is that it can achieve 10900K levels of performance with an easy overclock, particularly when considering the inevitable GPU bottleneck in many games for people who are playing with reasonable settings. That's not to discredit the 10900K, but we'll come back to that in a bit. The 10600K is a genuine leap for Intel, which has been stuck for multiple generations on unsellable i5 CPUs. This one, we think, redeems the i5 lineup, thanks to hyperthreading in large part, and is the most compelling buy for someone heavily focused on gaming performance maybe even with a minor non-daily focus on things like video production, 3D modeling, or similar applications. Although the R5-3600 may be more well-rounded, particularly at its price point as the main compelling reason for that, the 10600K is often within 4 to 5% of production level performance of the 3600 while managing potentially significantly higher frame rates. The 3600 is plenty capable to game. But if you really only care about gaming and don't use workstation applications, the 10600K makes the most sense. The 10600K combines well with the Z490 for its overclocking support, discussed later, and is a good tuning base that can reach performance levels AMD can't yet claim, at least in games. Further, regarding the common misconception that AMD Ryzen CPUs are somehow smoother or more consistent in frame time delivery, our data doesn't support that. 
The 10600K has higher in average FPS and also, in almost all cases, outmatches similarly priced Ryzen CPUs for frame time consistency, with overall few excursions from the interval N-1. Our criteria for the best gaming CPU includes price, but also absolute performance and ability to tune. In this regard, the 10600K can achieve 10900K stock performance in games, and it can be tuned until both of them hit a GPU limit. So although it's always an arms race, and the 10900K could also be overclocked, at some point, for most users, but not all, you'll probably hit a GPU bottleneck. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit, because there are some redeeming factors to the 10900K anyway. Until more threads are needed in games, this will be true in most cases, or until the 3080 Ti comes out. But for now, we're giving the 10600K our nod for the best gaming CPU, particularly or especially considering its price. Intel did well to get back in the game here, but it's not uncontested. AMD still has a long way to go to compete head-to-head -head with Intel for the gaming crown, and it's definitely catching up with every generation. So Intel's got to really get moving on 10 nanometer or whatever its next true iteration on processes in order to try and keep the lead that it's been able to stop gap hold for the last few releases. Next up, our recommendation for best budget gaming CPU, where we might recommend the Intel i5-10600K for gaming with less restrictive of a budget, or the 10900K for the absolute peak of FPS for the few competitively privileged enough to really need it and notice it, we'd recommend something else for more budget conscious gamers. The AMD Ryzen 3 3300X gets that recommendation. This CPU, with its pricing at $120 MSRP, is able to achieve 80-85% to of the performance of higher-end CPUs in most games. It's significantly better than the $100 3100 thanks to its 4 plus 0 CCX configuration rather than the 2 plus 2 CCX configuration of the 3100, where cross-CCX latency affects performance. So much so that even tuning Infinity Fabric and throwing better memory at the 3100 can't make up the gap against the 3300X in most of the tests that we published previously. The 3300X, critically, can be coupled with nearly any current generation video card without significant bottlenecking on the CPU for higher graphics settings. This does become less true if you care more about low graphics, high FPS competitive gaming, at which point our recommendation would shift toward the Intel parts instead. If you want more of a GPU bind though, meaning you prefer higher graphics settings, potentially higher resolutions than 1080p, although high enough graphics at 1080p is still a bind, or if you want something where the GPU is rapidly going to become more limiting than the CPU, the 3300X makes a lot of sense as a starting point for that approach, especially on a platform that has become mature enough now that you're no longer dealing with first gen Ryzen adopter BIOS challenges. We've been flashing through some of our bottleneck charts by this point, but you can check the previous content on that for more information on which GPUs make the most sense to pair with a 3300X. Although we absolutely do not recommend coupling a $1,250 2080Ti with a $120 CPU, technically you could do it and get at least half the performance in the worst case scenarios. The 2080 Super is about the peak for full performance in all the tests that we've done so far, but something more reasonably priced makes a lot more sense, particularly because GPUs are often easier to upgrade than CPUs anyway. Either way, the 3300X offers plenty of room. If you want to get more out of it, then look into our coverage on memory tuning and Infinity Fabric overclocking for AMD Ryzen CPUs. Some of it's from before the 3300X launch, but it all applies. That'll get you more mileage and increase FPS headroom. As for pairing a card with it, although you could go all the way up the stack and be mostly fine, something more price appropriate to the $120 part probably makes more sense just to make sure you're not overspending on one part and creating too much of an imbalance. As an honorable mention, we'll point out that the Athlon 3000G at roughly $60 is another good consideration for ultra-budget gaming. This is mostly a stopgap measure if you're playing simpler games with less of a graphic slant or if you're planning to upgrade later. We've tested this one a lot over the years, so we'll leave it as an honorable mention and just note that you can watch our previous content to get an idea of ideal use cases for AMD Athlon CPUs. The 200GE was an interesting one in a similar spot, and the 3000G is too. It's not what we'd call good, but it can certainly get you by if $100 is out of reach for now. Next up is best overall, which goes again to the Ryzen 5 3600. We awarded the 3600 the same honor in our best CPUs of 2019 piece that we published for end of year. The R5 3600 maintains this title even under direct fire from Intel's new 10600K, 
with the key distinction being that the 3600 in 2020 has had some of its viability in the mid-range gaming installations eroded by Intel's parts. That's for reasons discussed in the best gaming section, and even the best budget gaming section, because the 3300X takes some of the 3600's performance marks in games where the single CCX configuration benefits it. Either way, the 3600 still maintains its price and advantage against the Intel 10600K, it still maintains its versatility in production and gaming applications, and it maintains an average lead in applications like Blender, Premiere, V-Ray, and similar. It's not as big of a lead as once existed in the 200 to $260 class, but it's still a lead. And it's also about $100 cheaper at $180 at the time of writing on Newegg anyway, where the 10600K is closer or should be closer to 280. For anyone not as concerned about the highest frame rates, the 3600 makes the most sense, we think, for saving some money, but maintaining the production capabilities that you would lose with the 3300X. It's not as potentially core bound as the 3300X might become in the future. And so it provides some more reassurance for a longer lifespan. That said, trying to guess at the future or trying to future-proof a system is mostly a fool's errand. We view the 3600 as the new Sandy Bridge. This is the CPU people will be happy to have bought in six years, and people will have a hard time parting with it when it's time to upgrade. The price to performance was unbeatable at launch, and although it can now be beaten in gaming performance more consistently at a more reasonable configuration having hyper-threading on the Intel parts, the gap isn't always wide enough to justify the cost jump. With the 9600K, it was easy to recommend the 3600 instead, even though the 9600K often held a lead in gaming. And that's because the 3600 maintained better overall frame time consistency because specifically of its threat advantage in some games. The 3600 hangs on for another quarter in overall best value and best all around, and it's got the most balanced performance. Even for imbalanced workloads that are gaming oriented, it's hard to beat the 3600 in price to performance, at least up until Intel's newer stuff. The 10400 came close, but it misses when paired with a non-Z490 platform based on our knowledge today. The 10600K does win, but it's about $100 more expensive at the time of writing, and that's a big jump. Our next category is for the best small business and hobbyist production, which we assigned last year to the AMD R9 3950X. In light of current releases, that hasn't changed. Threadripper still offers value for the high-end workstation users, but for people who might be hobbyist artists, editors, or coders, or maybe own small businesses that work with CPU-intensive applications, the 3950X is justifiable as a means to better enable making money off of your work. It's not as full-on of a financial commitment as Threadripper is, but it still provides a lot of the benefits. Your major loss, other than more cores, is in PCIe links, and maybe in memory bandwidth with the difference in channeling. But the high core count and performance offers a lot for users of popular workstation applications or workflows. At our testing, we've seen the 3950X show expressive performance in code compiling in Windows, achieving the top rank on the chart outside of the significantly more expensive Threadripper series. Recently, we've also noticed that the 3950X has dropped from its launch price of $750 to normally about $700, which further strengthens the argument. In nearly every other production application we tested, the 3950X has come out on top of the processors near it in price class. It's the top in handbrake. It's at the top in compression and decompression workloads, near price class anyway, other than Threadripper. It's tied with the 10980XE in V-Ray, or very close to it, in applications like Premiere and rendering tasks. And it's also, the 3950X, a firm chart leader, again behind the 3970X, in Blender for cycles rendering on the CPU with heavy scenes. As a bonus, the 3950X is capable of gaming. Unlike AMD's original 16-core threader for CPU, the 3950X has solved many of the latency-related issues that caused problems where some games just didn't work. You definitely shouldn't buy it for a gaming system. But if you do mostly work on a machine and then sometimes play games, the 3950X is a capable performer. We see this as a good CPU choice for people who use or hope to use their computers to make money. Our next one is a natural transition into best high-end workstation. This is for people with thread-intensive, heavy production workloads, especially those who might be more established in their money-making endeavors. The 3990X comes out between our previous best CPUs piece and this one, and so it's a newcomer to the roundup. In terms of best overall value for a production machine, the 3970X makes more sense, definitely. But the 3990X does get crowned for, quote, best 
in the purest sense of the word in a lot of the tests, although not all of them. The 10980XE and the 3175X were Intel's attempts, with the 3175X coming out much before, but our recent revisit of the Intel W3175X showed it against parts like the 3990X, and we'll put that on the screen. It was rare that Intel could outmatch the 3990X, and even rarer that the Intel part and a motherboard could be bought for anywhere near the combined price of the Threadripper combination. In Blender, the 3990X scales cleanly and holds a significant lead even over the 3970X, of about 39% in the GN logo render. It's not as advantaged in Premiere, where the cores aren't fully leveraged, so it wouldn't be our go-to choice for a video editing machine. The 3950X splits the difference and makes a lot more sense there. The 3960X is also good in this application and is one that we use for our video editing machines. It's also the 3990X somewhat truncated in performance in the compression and decompression 7-zip testing, where the 3990X needs more memory bandwidth to really make full use of its cores. The CPU does, however, directly benefit in applications like Chaos Group's V-Ray, in code compiling with Chromium, and a few other tests that we've published. The biggest note is that you'll want to buy more RAM with the Threadripper 3990X. The amount will depend on your projects and what you're doing, but in our code compile, we saw a huge hit to performance where it fell to 200 minutes to render when coupled with 32 gigabytes of RAM while the 64 gigabyte solution allowed it to finish in 22 minutes. That difference is thanks to paging out to the drive, which hurts performance. The 3990X really needs to be partnered with other high-end parts, so the CPU cost alone isn't the only thing you're looking at in greasing here. You also need more or faster memory, depending on your applications that you're using, and you might potentially need a faster SSD or I.O. solution if you are in a scenario where you're going to be paging out every now and then. The best balance would be the 3970X, as you aren't overspending for constrained scenarios, but the 3950X would be the best price-conscious fallback that still achieves most of the performance in specific applications, like Premiere. As I mentioned, we'll note that Intel's high-frequency parts, like the 9700K and 9900K, are among the best performers in Photoshop. That specific application still seems to like frequency, so heavy Photoshop users might want to look elsewhere. Next is most fun to overclock. The Intel Core i9-10900K gets our recommendation as the most fun overclocking CPU. Intel's Z490 platform is completely insane for overclocking. It has overclocking features in abundance. Buildzoid has called the platform the easiest to overclock. And we've heard similar accolades from Joe of Bearded Hardware. In our own experience, we'd agree with the caveat that it's not only the easiest to tune, but also the most scalable to user experience. You don't have to be a pro like these guys to leverage the ease of overclocking features in Z490. If you want something that's good out of the box, but can also be treated like a tuning project for days off of work, we can highly recommend the Intel i9-10900K and a Z490 board with it. We've overclocked the 10900K both with standard cooling and with extreme cooling, like in our video with High Cookie, where we were reaching about 7 GHz, and the boards are supportive of both approaches. Z490 earmark features include the following. One is per-core hyper-threading, which allows tuning for applications that may have an optimal count of threads for peak performance, or might enable you to better do core binning. DMI and PEG overclocking for I.O. performance increases are also present in this version of the Intel chipset. For point number three, extremely capable memory overclocking support is a major one, with tuning upwards and beyond 5000 MHz for the best kits and skilled overclockers. Although BIOS overall depends on the vendor, the Z490 core feature set of OC knobs is replete with tools to research and tweak making it a great combination for enthusiasts who are more interested in the tuning aspect than the baseline performance. This is sort of like a project car, except it's a project car that came fully complete and functioning. Our next one is for biggest disappointment, a tradition for GN roundups. We were torn between the 10400 and the 10700K for reasons that you can check our reviews for. Ultimately, we decided to give the honor to the 10700K. That's because the 10700K is positioned in a way that doesn't give it much selling room. For workstation tasks, AMD's now same price, 3900X, gets you up to 12 cores instead, and it manages to win in nearly every production workload we tested. Because cores aren't everything, for gaming tasks, although the 10700K is objectively superior to AMD's offerings, Intel's own 10600K roughly matches it, or can be made to outmatch it. Meanwhile, $100 higher, anyone looking for the highest frame rate possible without any compromise should be looking at the 10900K instead. The 10700K fails to prove much value, as flanked between 
Intel's 10900K and 10600K, and as similarly contested by AMD's 3900X. Now finally, as we always like to do with these pieces, we also have a worst trend. And that one's going to be tone deaf marketing, which seems like you could mostly use that phrase for just about any worst trend at any point in time. AMD and Intel have both been guilty of tone deaf marketing lately. On AMD's side, there was the sort of almost playing a, a victim card in regard to the B550 X570 fiasco and the whole fracas around not supporting the 400 series motherboards for Zen 3 parts. But at the same time, AMD put itself in that position. AMD had some legitimate technical excuses that were valid, but also AMD's marketing is what caused the whole problem to begin with. And that's because AMD, whether it meant to or not, and through its partners, whether they meant to or not, did sort of lead people along thinking that they'd be able to upgrade later. So that's just what you get for taking shots at the other guy, in this case that'd be Intel, for doing something that you will eventually do. And we have a, a whole series on all of that if you want to learn more about it. Andy had many technical reasons that were valid. It ended up walking it back and has new technical issues that will emerge. But at the end of the day, it was all caused by tone deaf marketing. On Intel's side, Intel is so focused on having six times more soldiers in total war that it has also overlooked some of its own poor marketing. One of those was the phrase that we sort of went off on on our Intel 10 series specifications roundup, where we talked about how Intel presented that X percent of games are single threaded or optimized for single thread, is specifically what the marketing tag said. Optimized for single thread. When we pushed on that matter, it proved that uh, it wasn't defensible. And so Intel struck that line from its PDF and re-released a revised version. So this is another instance where marketing, if not for being challenged by technical press or users, will obviously just try to say whatever it wants. And in both scenarios, Intel and AMD have demonstrated that uh, they apparently seem to have maybe numbers to back it up, but they seem to think that just marketing the product on its merits alone isn't good enough. And both companies have to sort of tweak the wording one way or the other to be maybe a little bit gray area as to whether what they're saying is even possible for being true. Not just if it's true, which is normal marketing, but if there's any possibility that what they've said can be reinforced with data. Uh, and then that, I mean, that's just, it's just where we are with the sort of tribal mentality of picking a brand and defending it. In any case, the, the end result hopefully will that be that both companies can learn from their respective experiences in the last month and hopefully focus on revising to market instead on the actually very strong independent merits of each of their products in an objective sense, rather than trying to tweak the dialogue to mislead people. And that'll bring us to the end. So hopefully that helps out with getting a handle on the CPU situation right now. There's a ton of stuff out there we've released I think at least some of our highest quality content in a long time with back-to-back -back really in-depth reviews of each of the new CPUs. We have follow-up coverage, we have overclocking coverage, we have live streams with liquid nitrogen if that interests you, and then we've got recaps of those if you want the short version. So if it's been a little while, you're building the first system in a couple of years or something, each of those content pieces would be a great place to go once you think you've found a CPU maybe from this list and want to learn more about it. And we'll point you that way so that you can learn more about the CPU you're potentially choosing, including things like power, thermals, all that stuff. Thanks for watching. As always, if you want to support this type of content, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and backorder one of our mouse mats. They uh, sold out basically immediately, but we do have more coming back in, or the mod mats are there as well. And go to patreon.com gamersnexus to help us out directly. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.